I always smile when I think of Bodhidharma. The delight of my heart is truly the light of my heart. When I but think upon this 28th patriarch of Indian Buddhism. He is also the founder of the Zen school of Chinese and Japanese Buddhism. According to tradition, the origin of Zen actually goes back to Lord Gautama Buddha. Buddhist author Christmas Humphreys writes, it is said that once when the Buddha was seated with his bhikkhus, his monks, a Brahma Raja came to him and offering him a golden flower asked him to preach the Dharma. The enlightened one accepted the flower and holding it aloft gazed at it in silence. After a while one of the monks, the venerable Mahakashyapa, smiled. Such is the origin of Zen Buddhism. For it is said that this smile was handed down by 28 successive patriarchs, the last being the Indian philosopher Bodhidharma. When I think of this smile, I think of the sense of having a secret, of having overcome maya and illusion, of having the secret of the destruction of that which is evil, the empowerment of that which is good, and the smile that says, I am becoming the Buddha. It is the sense that you know something and you have a secret that many do not know, but which you can impart with a flower and with a smile. Who was Bodhidharma? How did he come to bring his unique message to China? In the introduction to the Zen teaching of Bodhidharma, Red Pine writes, Bodhidharma was born around the year 440 in Kanchi, the capital of the southern Indian kingdom of Pallava. He was a Brahman, a member of the priestly class by birth, and the third son of King Simhavarman. Simhavarman. When he was young, he was converted to Buddhism and later he received instruction in the Dharma from one called Prajnatara, whom his father had invited to Magda, to Magda from the ancient Buddhist heartland. It was Prajnatara who also told Bodhidharma to go to China. He left by ship and after skirting the Indian coast and the Malay Peninsula for three years, Bodhidharma finally arrived in southern China. One of the historians who chronicled Bodhidharma's life tells us this. He was a man of wonderful intelligence, bright and far-reaching. He thoroughly understood everything that he had ever learned. As his ambition was to master the doctrine of the Mahayana, he abandoned the white dress of a layman and put on the robe of monkhood, wishing to cultivate the seeds of holiness cultivate the seeds of holiness. Take that teaching. If you desire holiness, cultivate the seeds. The seeds are the germs of truth, exalted thoughts and honor. Cultivate seeds of holiness. He practiced contemplation and tranquilization. You can't practice contemplation and tranquilization if you are always in a tizzy or always talking, or never focusing the mind. In other words, there are known ways of approaching and becoming and realizing the Buddha that is within you. These known ways we must study. We must be like the ones who were successful. Bodhidharma knew well what was the true significance of worldly affairs. His virtues, his virtues were more than a model to the world. He was very much grieved over the decline of orthodox teaching of the Buddha in the remoter parts of the earth. He finally made up his mind to cross over land and sea and come to China and preach his doctrine in the kingdom of Wei. 
Those that were spiritually inclined gathered about him full of devotion, while those that could not rise above their own one-sided views talked about him slanderingly. Thus we understand in the person of Maitreya and the Mystery School that people judge us individually, personally, from the level of their own state of consciousness. Some perceive the exaltation of the divine mind within you, within me, and others only see human, human foibles and the lowest level of the human consciousness. Our perception of the Buddha in one another guarantees our mirroring of that Buddha in ourselves. Likewise, as we perceive low levels of consciousness and dwell upon them in levels of gossip, etc., that is what we become, that is what we perpetuate, and that is the momentum, unfortunately, that carries us downward. Dr. Thich Thien An, in his book, Zen Philosophy, Zen Practice, says, Bodhidharma came to China about 520 AD, a thousand years after the time of Gautama Buddha. When he arrived, Buddhism was well established. There were many sincere Chinese Buddhists who understood the doctrine well, generously supported the religion, and cultivated the way with great energy. Nevertheless, something was lacking. Something was lacking. It was a void that Bodhidharma was to fill. What was lacking was the transmission of the mind of enlightenment. Studying Zen Buddhism is a path whereby we seek the transmission of the mind of enlightenment. We empty the vessel of the lower mind we enter the divine mind, and we welcome the Buddha to our temple. At the time of his arrival, the ruler of China was Emperor Wu Di of the Liang Dynasty. Emperor Wu Di was an ardent Buddhist, a scholar as well as a supporter and a devotee. Through his contacts with other Buddhist masters, he had come to understand Buddhist philosophy very well. When he heard that the great master Bodhidharma had arrived in China, he was beside himself with delight and promptly invited the master to his court. The opportunity to see and learn from such a master was all too rare. When Bodhidharma entered the court, the emperor, after paying his proper respects, spoke to the master thus. For a long time, I have used my own money to support many Buddhist temples and ordain many Buddhist monks and nuns. I have built schools for children and hospitals for the sick and aged. I have printed many Buddhist texts for free distribution to the people. I have done so many good things for Buddhism and for my people. Would you please tell me how much merit I will get? Without a moment's hesitation, Bodhidharma answered, No merit at all. The response struck the emperor like a slap. The other masters had all taught him quite differently. Do good, they said, and you will receive good. Do bad, and you will receive bad. Effects follow causes as shadows follow figures. But now the emperor thought, Though I have done many good things, this master says, no merit at all. He was perplexed. Why did Bodhidharma answer the way he did? Perhaps he wanted to say that if we do good with the desire to gain merits for ourselves, that is not good. It is not good because we are not working for the welfare of others. We are working for our own welfare we are working to promote ourselves. Perhaps this is what Bodhidharma meant to say, but Bodhidharma was not the kind of man to give long explanations. Therefore, without a moment's hesitation, he answered, no merit at all. We remember the teachings of Jesus Christ to Catherine of Siena. He taught her there was no merit in anything in this world, if 
if you did not serve to the glory of God and give God the glory for all of your works. That is the simple teaching in a nutshell of Jesus Christ, the disciple of Maitreya, the disciple of Gautama Buddha. The emperor then asked Bodhidharma another question. Would you please tell me what is the essence of Buddhism? Short and sharp, the answer came, no essence at all. The emperor was stunned, no essence at all. When he had asked the other masters this question, they explained with many words, arguments, illustrations, and proofs, the basic doctrines of Buddhism. One showed that the doctrine of cause and effect is the essence of Buddhism. Another, the theory of karma and rebirth. Another, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Noble Path, the Bodhisattva Ideal, etc. But here is this great, highly respected master, and he answers, no essence at all. Why did Bodhidharma answer the way he did? Perhaps he wanted to say that all the teachings in Buddhism are but methods to be practiced, skillful means or expedients, and that what constitutes the essence for one man may not be the essence for another. Or perhaps he wanted to say that the original mind of enlightenment is the all-illumining void in which there is nothing to be grasped and no one to grasp and therefore no essence at all. But, dope. but Bodhidharma was not the kind of man to waste words. Therefore, short and sharp, the answer came, no essence at all. This answer did not please the emperor. However, he tried to be patient and asked one more question of Bodhidharma. You say that according to Buddhism, everything is nothing, that all things have no essence. Well then, who is he that is talking with me now? Bodhidharma answered, I do not know. <laughs> this reply shocked the emperor. He lost his patience, dismissed Bodhidharma from his court, and retired to his chambers, his head swirling in confusion. Meanwhile, left to himself, Bodhidharma thought, this man is a Buddhist scholar, and yet even he could not understand. Perhaps conditions are not yet favorable enough for me to teach. So he went to the Shaolin Monastery in the state of Wei, sat cross-legged before a wall, and entered into a deep state of meditation. So it goes that he sat like this for nine years, waiting for conditions to ripen waiting for someone to appear who would be capable of receiving the transmission of the wonderful Buddha mind, that priceless treasure he had traveled all the way from India to China to transmit. Red Pine says, Bodhidharma is said to have spent nine years in meditation, facing the rock wall of a cave about a mile from the temple. Shaolin later became faces famous for training monks in Kung Fu, known to Americans as the martial art Kung Fu. And Bodhidharma is honored as the founder of this art as well. Bodhidharma's years of concentrated meditation earned him the title Wall-Gazing Brahman. Some Zen Buddhists do not take Bodhidharma's wall-gazing literally. Instead, they say it is symbolic of the state of desirelessness and the strong mind that is necessary to achieve enlightenment. I believe that the wall gazing was a very physical experience of Bodhidharma, a way in which he was sending a message and to those who would have an ear to hear and be able to observe, they would understand why he was wall gazing, why he was meditating and why wall gazing because it is a total preoccupation shows that one is free from all desires. If you have no desires, perhaps you could go out and gaze upon a wall for any length of time, for you would have no other desire. 
Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki believes that the deeper meaning of Bodhidharma's wall gazing may be related to the Buddhist teaching that only the strong mind is characteristic of one who can enter upon the realm of reality. So long as there are pantings or gaspings in the mind, it is not free, it is not liberated, says Suzuki. A strong mind is your most important tool in this lifetime, all lifetimes. If your mind is not strong, if it is weak, if it can be pulled to the left and the right, drawn here, drawn there, moments after you have made a resolution to do this or that, if you do not have a strong mind, you will not be able to outpicture the strong Buddha. Heed these words. It is key to your victory. If your mind is not strong, your brain is not strong, your organs are not strong, heal them. Heal them by ways we have shown and taught you in the physical. The mind must be strong or firm and steady, self-possessed and concentrating simply not moved from its resolution. Bodhidharma taught this concept to his chief disciple when he told him, externally keep yourself away from all relationships and internally have no pantings, that is hankerings, in your heart. If you hanker after this and you hanker after that and you hanker after the next thing, how long will it take you to sustain the mind of Buddha where you are. Each interruption, each disruption of the joy of internalizing the Buddha weakens your resolve, weakens the momentum. It's like starting and stopping a train or a car. Start and stop and start and stop. Pretty soon you are frantic and you live your life in a frantic sense of starting and stopping. Instead of controlling the mind, therefore controlling one's environment by the mind. This is Zen. It is the point of Zen. Bodhidharma said to his chief disciple, When your mind is like unto a straight standing wall, you may enter into the path. Artists often portray Bodhidharma's fierce concentration by depicting him with bulging eyes and a gruff, intense demeanor. This is a slide of him in that demeanor. <laughs> this is a very telling slide, a very telling rendition of Bodhidharma, which we'll get to later. Alan Watts explains in his book, The Way of Zen. A legend says that Bodhidharma once fell asleep in meditation and was so furious that he cut off his eyelids and falling to the ground they arose as the first tea plant. Tea has thereafter supplied Zen monks with a protection against sleep. We use bancha tea. Bancha tea is made from the twigs, the twigs of the tea plant. It has a minute amount of caffeine in, to, in it, whereas the leaves have a greater amount of caffeine. So when we are drinking the bancha tea, let us drink to Bodhidharma. Another legend holds that Bodhidharma sat so long in meditation that his legs fell off. <laughs> are not our legs the sustaining pillars of movement, of being? Why would his legs fall off? Hence the delightful symbolism of those Japanese Daruma dolls, which represent Bodhidharma as a legless roly-poly, so weighted inside that he always stands up again when pushed over. A popular Japanese poem says of the Daruma doll, such is life, seven times down, eight times up. Always coming up never remaining down. During Bodhidharma's stay near the Shaolin Monastery, he met the man who was to become his chief disciple. He was a scholar named Hui Ke. Hui Ke begged Bodhidharma to teach him, but the master just ignored him. Scholar Heinrich Dummelin paints the scene. 
Determined to attain the Tao, the highest enlightenment at any cost, Huayi Kao besieged Bodhidharma day and night with his entreaties. Bodhidharma, however, paid no attention to him. On the 9th of December, the chronicle marks it well, the decisive moment arrived. It was an icy cold winter night. A storm was raging and the wind was whipping the snow about wildly. Moved to compassion, the master looked upon the figure standing there motionless before him in the cold and asked him what he wanted. In so doing, he let him know that one final decisive effort was needed. Huey Ka drew out a sharp knife and cut off his left arm at the elbow, presenting it to Bodhidharma. At that, the master accepted him as a disciple. Have you ever said of mundane things, I'd give my right arm if I could have this, or I could meet this person, or I could do this? I would expect that you would no longer offer your right arm because Bodhidharma might just accept it from you. The Zen master Sokeon says that many students of the Zen school do not accept this cutting off of the arm in the literal sense. To cut off is interpreted as casting aside all traditional methods for arriving at the final truth. It is very clear that this disciple was determined to become the disciple of Bodhidharma and that he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in order to receive the training. I know people who avoid me always because I might give them some teaching or might give them some correction. But I'm still here and I'm still waiting. And if you want some teaching or some correction, don't fear. Don't fear to change your mind, to change your thought patterns, change your feeling patterns. You have to ask yourself, what do I want to give up of this life that is worth giving up so that I may have the jewel of enlightenment? You can't have all the baggage of the world and enlightenment at the same time for the simple reason that if you have all the baggage of the world, you spend all of your life tending to that baggage of the world and all of your possessions. So as you let go of them, you are free to pursue single, the single path of enlightenment. Dr. Tik Tian An describes the next part of the legend. Seeing the sincerity of the monk, Bodhidharma realized that here was a man capable of receiving the Dharma. Write that question down in your notes. Am I one who is capable of receiving the Dharma? What is the Dharma? The Dharma is the great law. It is the divine law. It is the great wheel of the law in action in our causal bodies. If we cannot receive the whole Dharma, can we receive a portion of the Dharma? A crumb of life and then the whole loaf? When Bodhidharma asked him, what do you want from me? Hui Ke replied, for a long time I have tried to keep my mind calm and pure by practicing meditation. But when I meditate, I become bothered by many thoughts and cannot keep my mind calm. Would you please tell me how to pacify my mind? Bodhidharma smiled and answered. Each time I hear about Bodhidharma smiling, I always smile. Bodhidharma said, bring me that mind and I will help you pacify it. Hui Ke stopped, searched within, looking for his mind and after a time said, I am looking for my mind, but I can't find it. There, Bodhidharma declared, I have already pacified it. <laughs> With these words, Hui Ke's mad mind suddenly halted. Suddenly halted. Are you observers of your mind? How many of you really take time to observe what your mind is doing? Wonderful. Well, keep doing it. Keep observing your mind. Observe how the mind works when you have proper prana, air, exercise, the proper food. And think of the times of the day, the meridians on the clock, 
when this or that or the next organ is not functioning as well as it does when it is at its best. And if you look at the clock of your day and you look at the Chinese wheel of the meridians and you see how every day at a certain time you have a drop in energy and every day at a certain time you are at the zenith of your attunement with God, you feel like you could just go up the shaft of your crystal cord and be at one with a whole universe in your causal body. Most of us have a very regular clock, but we don't pay any attention to it. Sometimes when we are at the height of attunement, we think, well, I will be thus attuned for the rest of my life. But two or three hours later, after a meal or the wrong meal, we think of ourselves as dense and not able to be creative or do a thing. So knowing the signs of the clock, of the working of the mind, means that you know what time of day you have the greatest contact with God or the contact with your own calling, your creativity, what you must do in this life, the balancing of your karma. So let us think more about observing the mind and then getting fed up with the sloth of the mind when it's not working properly and we are not really doing anything that is worthwhile. And so for Hui Ke, a veil lifted. A veil lifted and he was enlightened. What I learned from this teaching is the following. The more we surrender, the more we realize that nothing of this world really means anything to us, that what we are really seeking is enlightenment. Such as this disciple who followed Bodhidharma and followed him until finally he was accepted. And Bodhidharma was convinced that he had the determination to see through this path. Because he gave so much, which was all of his life, for the gift of enlightenment, the very first lesson that is recounted he receives the lifting of the veil of that human consciousness and enters into the enlightenment through the crown chakra. When he took the mind to be real, then the wandering mind disturbed him in his meditation. But now that he could not find that wandering mind, he realized the mind is no mind, that nothing can be disturbed. I'll read that to you again. These are the mysteries of Zen. Hueka, when he took the mind to be real, then the wandering mind disturbed him in his meditation. If you think your mind is real, then you are giving it the power to disturb you, no matter what it is doing. But if he could not find the wandering mind, he realized that his mind was no mind. And therefore, that something that is nothing cannot be disturbed. And from that no mind, he realized the one mind. The no mind is the mind emptied, the mind that is not a mind at all. When we get rid of that mind, this vessel is a vessel exclusively for the divine mind. We may perceive the divine mind through the central nervous system, through every cell of our body, through every organ. We can say that the divine mind is in every cell, in every electron. So we are a chalice for the one mind. But if we are determined to go through the human mind or to, to depend upon the brain, then we will not have the emptiness to receive the one mind. And the one mind is a capital O and a capital M, and it is hyphenated. One mind, no mind. They are both hyphenated. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call one 800 245-5445. That's 1-800-245-5445. With that realization, Hui Ke became the disciple of Bodhidharma. I find this a wondrous experience. 
I wonder how many of you here have ever, ever had the realization that enlightenment or an understanding or a piercing of some kohan, some conundrum did not come to you through your brain but came through, to you through the higher consciousness of your divine mind directly without having to pass through the brain. Have you had that experience? It's a wonderful experience. It proves the path of Zen. It proves eternal life. It proves that people who are brain dead are alive and well and one with the universal mind of God. It proves that we exist apart from this body. And the more we enter the Dharma, the Dharmakaya, and then the body, the Nirmanakaya, the Sambodhkaya, representing the Christ, and the Nirvana, Nirmanakaya, the lower self. When we enter those vessels and build those vessels, we are weaning ourselves from dependency upon the flesh. And that dependency makes us fear death, fear the afterlife, fear our beginnings and our endings and our days. The joy of Zen is to daily internalize eternal life, the infinite nature of being, and the Buddha mind. After Bodhidharma's passing, Hui Ke, who had become his disciple, inherited the robe and bowl and became the second patriarch of Chinese Zen Buddhism. Although Bodhidharma is spiritual father to millions of Zen Buddhists today, he evidently had few followers in his own lifetime. The chronicles of his life mention only three disciples. According to one account, Bodhidharma died after he was poisoned by a jealous monk. Another account says he died of old age, sometime after his rivals had tried to poison him five times. Red Pine says, according to Dao Yuan, Bodhidharma's remains were interred near Luoyang at Dinglin Temple on Bear Ear Mountain. Dao Yuan adds that three years later, an official met Bodhidharma walking in the mountains of Central Asia. He was carrying a staff from which hung a single sandal, and he told the official he was going back to India. Reports of this meeting aroused the curiosity of other monks who finally agreed to open Bodhidharma's tomb. But inside all they found was a single sandal. <laughs> and ever since then Bodhidharma has been pictured carrying a staff from which hangs the missing sandal. And we are still waiting for the other sandal to drop. <laughs> Tradition says that Bodhidharma brought a special message from India to China, which encapsulates Zen philosophy. It reads, A special transmission outside the scriptures. No dependence upon words and letters. These are the statements which encapsulate Zen philosophy. You should write them down. Number one is, A special transmission outside the scriptures. Two is no dependence upon words and letters. Three, direct pointing at the mind of man. Four, seeing into one's nature and the attainment of Buddhahood. Bodhidharma's message is that we cannot realize ultimate truth or attain our own Buddhahood by means of words and letters. No, we must discover for ourselves our real nature. And what is our real nature? It is the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature. How shall you define the Buddha nature within you? You will think upon those virtues and attributes that you would imagine Bodhidharma Gautama Buddha, Amitabha, five Dhyani Buddhas, and many, many other Buddhas unnamed, what they would have in their little bags, what they would have as virtue. Strength of mind, oneness of purpose, profound compassion, 
grace, mercy, non-attachment to the fruit of action, doing things for the sake of doing good things rather than for reward or recognition. Think of all those qualities you would imagine the Buddha to have and realize that those qualities are the Buddha nature. And they are seeds. And as you water them and let the sun shine upon them, they grow, they come up through the earth, they defy gravity, they keep growing, and they show us those things that have germinated from within our Buddha nature. This is a reason for living. This is a reason for being. We can have many achievements in this life, but the realization of the Buddha nature gives us spherical being and the ability to reach out and do those things that the Buddhas have done whereby they attained full outer manifestation of Buddhahood. Before I read to you the teachings of Bodhidharma, I want to review some of the basic precepts of Zen. The word Zen is Japanese for the Chinese Chan, which comes from the Sanskrit Dhyana. Dhyana is commonly translated as meditation. The Encyclopedia of Eastern Philosophy and Religion says it refers to collectedness of mind or meditative absorption. This tells me of bringing all the components of the mind together in a very centered yang sphere. And that yang sphere does not allow us to contain anything that is not yang in that sphere, in the wide expanse of the spheres of the, of the causal body, we have the balance of the yin force. But in the center, there is that collectedness of mind, all that is worth having and saving, which we would say, yes, this I identify as the buddhic nature of my being. This shall be established in my core in the very center of my threefold flame, in the very center of the Atman, alive within my breast. Yes, this core, I will gather, I will pull together, I will not be without knowledge, I will not be without awareness, and this core will then be the focal point of enlightenment, the, enlight the enlightenment of the Buddha that I seek. Meditative absorption going within. Scholar Kenneth Chun describes Zen as an intuitive method of spiritual training aimed at the discovery of a reality in the innermost recesses of the soul. I was talking to someone who said, I don't know who I am. Actually, this is a very profound, profound point of beginning because it acknowledges I am not the human being. I am not someone identified by a name or a number, a social security number or any other number. Who am I? I am the son, the daughter of my parents. I have a name and I have a tradition. But really, who am I? The statement, I don't know who I am, is actually a statement of the beginning of wisdom. Ask yourself the question, who am I? And see what you can come up with that is of enduring being. What part of you, if you were to be distilled, what part of you would be left when everything else evaporated? And then, how would you identify yourself? Would you know who you were then? Perhaps you would begin to know the essence of self, the essence of self. And so Zen, again, is described as an intuitive method of spiritual training aimed at the discovery of a reality in the innermost recesses of the soul. Chun says, this reality is the fundamental unity which pervades all the differences and particulars of the world. 
Out there, there are all these differences and particulars, all these things, millions of things. But our reality is the fundamental unity. What cannot become part of this unity that says I and then I am cannot be considered to be who I am, who this real self is. This reality is called the mind or the Buddha nature that is present in all sentient beings. We have the Buddha nature, but have we distilled it? Have we gone after it? Have we meditated upon it or given a simple mantra in contemplation of it? Those of us who are from the West and the traditions of Western civilization are not trained in the youngness of the concentration of the mind and then the transcendence of the mind to the Buddha mind. And our diet and our TV and the kinds of things we consider recreation and, and entertainment except sports of skill and focus that require that Buddha mind to achieve except for those, we find that it's so easy for the bubbles of self to just go off into eternal space. No concentration of identity here in the heart. The guarding of the heart, the book heart, dictated to Helena Rorick, it's very important to study the nature of the heart as the center of your universe. Very important to recognize what of you will be there in eternity and what will be in the earth or spread as ashes on Maitreya's mountain. We must think in terms of Venus far in the distant past, far in the distant future and take this crucible in time and space as supreme opportunity to define and intensify our reality. Intensify it, yes, by the good works by the profound love we have for others, by complete non-attachment to our works, and yet we are always doing those works like the great Tao that appears to do nothing but does everything. It is wonderful to enter this plane of self-discovery, to latch onto it, and to realize that what is going to go up into the light is the Buddha nature, and all things that you have made real, that are real about you. I challenge you to take more with you as the fruit of this life than you have ever done since you have left the Garden of Eden, Maitreya's Mystery School. I challenge you to build every day the greater presence. Remember your role model, Gautama Buddha. He is the keeper of the threefold flame of life for all upon earth. Some of us can barely keep the threefold flame for ourselves, let alone sustain it for others as they go in their ups and their downs and as they lose that threefold flame. Think then of what you have as raw material to build, to realize, to unfold this tight kernel of the Buddha nature. You have a threefold flame. You have seven chakras. You have the secret chamber of the heart. These are eternal aspects of your being. You have the Atman within. You have a Holy Christ Self to whom you will bond. You have the I Am Presence to whom you will ascend. We have a part and a momentum and a very great momentum of God within ourselves. That is the Buddha nature. All that I have named is the Buddha nature. Purify the chakras by mantra. Attain peace from all hankerings and use your days and hours constructively as you strengthen by your mantras the great Antakarana comprised of all souls of light who have the Buddha nature. Zen teaches that this reality is Shunya Shunya, meaning empty or void, inexpressible in words and inconceivable in thought. To illustrate this, the Zen masters often resorted to silence or negation to express the truth. 
Being inexpressible and inconceivable, this reality, or the Buddha nature, can only be apprehended by intuition directly, completely, and instantly. Write down those three words, directly, completely, and instantly. Then try to think of how many times in your life, all the way to, to being a small child, you had an instant perception of someone or something, direct, complete, a complete thought form before you, like a flash, never went through the brain, the reasoning, the rational mind. Cultivate this, empty the mind, be ready for the direct transfusion from the mind of Buddha to your Buddha nature. Give the mantra, I am changing all my garments, old ones, for the bright new day. With the sun of understanding, I am shining all the way. I am light, the Buddha light. I am light within, without. I am light is all about. Fill me, free me. Purify me, heal me, seal me. Purify me until transfigured they describe me. I am shining like the sun. I am shining like the sun. This is a pivot decree in our heart, head, and hand decrees. Seal me, heal me, purify me. Because it spells change second by second and moment by moment. Each time you give that decree, you are not the person you were the second before you gave it because it is a decree of transfiguration and self-transcendence. If with that simple mantra you can continually transcend yourself, think of the joy of anticipation of the realization of the self-transcending Buddha nature. Nothing is static. Nothing is still. Only death is still and static. But we are moving on. We are changing the garments of the mind. We are putting on the garments of the Buddha nature. This is why it's exciting to be on earth, because earth is the launching pad for our self-transcendence. And what a glorious place and retreat God has given to us to realize this. How grateful we are. Intellectual analysis can only divide and describe and scratch the surface. It is so not native to those on the spiritual path that it is hard, unless you have a computer mind, to remember all of the intellectual teachings you have received. But you never forget the instantaneous communion with the mind of Buddha. Chan says, in order to apprehend the Buddha nature, one must calm the mind. What agitates the mind? I believe what agitates the mind is fear, anxiety. Anxiety is an agitation that is acidic. It plagues the heart. It plagues the being. It plagues one's life. It makes people indecisive. Taken to its fullest extent, extent, it is called imperil. Imperil is also discussed in the Rorik works as being a deadly poison, a fear that is immobilizing. That fear that is immobilizing totally cuts off the Buddha mind. Calm the mind. The only calm mind that I know is the mind that has embodied the fearlessness flame. Why don't you select that as top on our list of remaining decrees for this summer session? Fearlessness flame, white fire and green. You cannot calm the mind unless you are fearless. And the forces of Mara will always tempt you with something greater and greater and greater that's, that makes you say, this thing is so terrible that I fear it. You have to make your peace with fear and every calamity that can come upon you throughout the world, throughout your lifetime. Make your peace with the calmness of the Buddhic nature and know the 
Because you have embraced the will of God, God will sustain you. You will be tempted by fearsome odds of demons and fallen ones just like Gautama Buddha, as you have learned about Siddhartha. Just know that if you fear nothing, nothing can move you. If God is there, and he is, there is nothing to fear. When the Zen follower apprehends the Buddha nature within himself, he experiences an awakening or enlightenment called Wu in Chinese or Satori in Japanese. It is an awareness of the undifferentiated unity of all existence. Undifferentiated unity of all existence. That is the awareness we seek. Again, when the Zen follower ap apprehends the Buddha nature within himself, he experiences an awakening or enlightenment called Wu or Satori, an awareness of the undifferentiated unity of all existence sometimes called undifferentiated suchness, undifferentiated being. One glyph comes to mind, rolling out the dough to make Christmas cookies. You have a form of a little man, maybe a gingerbread man, and you put this form down all over the dough on the table. The undifferentiated suchness is that each cookie is made out of the same dough and the dough is only one, even though it appears to be many gingerbread men. The undifferentiated suchness is that we are the lesser all contained in the greater all. We are this gingerbread man and even if we are cut out of the great all, we are not differentiated from it. This is a very profound teaching. You have to think about it. The one who has this awareness is now one with the whole universe. He will never see himself as apart from it, but just as an outline on that universe. He sees all particulars and differences merged into one fundamental unity and he is no longer troubled by problems and incidents. This apprehension does not mean the acquisition of something new. It means only the realization of something that is always present in him. Have you found that essence of your being that is always present in you? If you have not, you may very well ask, who am I? I don't know who I am. Because you can only define being by the being of God that is in you. You cannot define it by human name, place, and serial number. The only trouble is that he is not aware of this because of his ignorance and folly. It means only the realization of something that is always present in him but he is not aware of this because of his ignorance and folly. It is impossible to be truly on the path, to be straight in one's sense of holiness, of prayer, of the ritual of mantra, the science of decrees, to walk the spiritual path, to use the violet flame, to understand the Buddha of the violet flame, to understand this, means that day by day and then suddenly we have the realization of our inner godhood our inner buddha nature it comes upon one gradually but one day you awaken to this and that is what gives you the solidity of the rock that will not be moved because god reality is in you so keep on keeping on and establish the rhythm of the cycles of the days and communion with God and rituals and prayers and mantras. And let not the anti-Buddha nature, the anti-Buddha being the dweller on the threshold, take from you this glorious path that you can achieve and realize, I promise you in this life, 
simply work at it and know the freedom of becoming the Buddha. For more information on Elizabeth Clare Prophet's prophetic vision and spiritual solutions, call 1-800-245-5445. The preceding program was presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047-5000. If you'd like to know more, call this number or write this address. For a free book by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, or for more information about her teachings on the world's major religions, Call 1-800-245-5445.